so one of the things we try to avoid as a church is having excessive amounts of programs because part of being a mature human being and Christian is to engage in the relationships of life, of life on our own accord, like making friends, forming families, that kind of stuff. And so programs actually weaken us sometimes. But we do have a certain number of partnerships to kind of get us going in the right direction and to create structure where structure is very helpful, right? And so um, one of the partnerships that we've had that we haven't really activated yet, but we've but we've been in for a little while, is a partnership with Orchard Ridge Elementary School, specifically because we need to partner with the administration and the people working in that school. And so um, Becky Kunder, who is their principal, the principal of the primary school, is with us today, and we're gonna hear a little bit about um, her school and stuff so that we can, you know how to get engaged with that as one way to love in our city, okay? So this is Becky. So, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your school, the school you lead? I am Becky Kundert. I'm the principal at Orchard Ridge Elementary. This is my fourth year. We are located off of Whitney Way exit, so not too far from here, probably a seven minute drive. Um, and we are a neighborhood school, which is really unique in Madison, so we don't have any buses. All of our kids are within walking distance to our building, which means we're also within walking distance for them, to their homes with them. Cool. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about tutoring in your school and why, why having tutors would be really helpful? Yeah. So we are a 4K through 8 building, actually. So we have 1,000 students in our whole building. I am the principal of the elementary side, so 4K are four-year-olds through fifth grade students. And tutoring is critical for our students because what you all know is when you're in a classroom with anywhere from 18 to 22 students, that you can be leading whole group instruction and then they break up into their centers for their learning and reading, writing and math in particular and do independent work or partner work. And what we all know about little kids is that they wanna be able to share their journey and their work with other people. And so they are more highly engaged if all of you were there to be able to read with them or to write with them or to help them solve their math problems, which is a learning experience all in itself, even for me, as math has changed quite a bit, or how we do math has changed quite a bit. So it's something exciting. And the kids love, because we are a neighborhood school, they love to see other people coming in and investing in them. And that also shows our families about the commitment that the whole community is making for, for, their, for their children too. So getting involved, um, we've got some forms they can fill out. It's fairly easy to get involved. There's a disclosure to make sure that you're not some kind of nasty offender. And then that's it, man. You can get in there and work with kids. And so can you like tell us a story about a kid that like tutoring was like made a difference? So I was asked on the fly last time, so now yeah. I can oh, phrase good. it a little bit good, better. Good. So I think of a second grade student that we have who um, somebody had come in to tutor, to volunteer for, um, to help them in math. Um, and they got paired up. And um, the volunteer also and the student, neither one of them really wanted to dig into writing. Um, what is funny is that now it's made a difference, I think, for the tutor and that the tutor actually comes to school two other times in a week and comes in during writing time. And what's really ironic is that the student is also writing notes like writing a note about like what they've done and journaling with the tutor, which in itself for me is a win-win. So now we have somebody who's expanded into writing and I have a student who on their own time, right, on your own time, clearly it's becoming something they enjoy doing, is actually writing as well. Cool, that's great. So Lloyd, you've been doing this for a, a few years now. Um, can you tell us like why you've been doing it and what you're seeing? Yeah, um, you know that uh, here at High Point we connect, grow, and serve, and underserve, one of our things is to serve the city. And I've always had a passion for uh, education. I really think that uh, for those who are struggling, poor, one of the best ways to alleviate that gap is to educate them well and then release them out into the world to, to uh, contribute to themselves as well as society. So I've been uh, tutoring first grade for, this would be my fifth year straight, I chose first grade because the data says that if a kid isn't on their reading level or math level by the third grade, you can predict things like dropout rates, you can predict things like incarceration rates. So I wanted to impart my love uh, for students uh, early on. 
uh, yeah, so that's why that's why I did it. And so you stay with a first grade classroom because you have a relationship with that teacher. Yes. You also some people are like, well, can I go with a kid with a group of kids through? And you can do that too. Yeah. So you can start in kindergarten or first grade, and then you can go through, uh, well, part till eighth grade mm -hmm. in your school. Yeah. So. Um, Lloyd, so we're trying to recruit some volunteers for this. Like, what are what are some goals? Like, if we were like, okay, as a church, we want to make a a real measurable difference in this school. Like, how many how many like warm bodies that yeah. love kids is that going to take? Uh, uh, I I was astounded after we did our in the first service, we had. 30 people. Yeah, don't tell so them that. The, Nobody was volunteered. Scout. Nobody volunteered. No Nobody. One not one person. Last right? service. We need 100 volunteers in and, this service. And Nick will be talking about faith. And so Nick said in the first service, 30. And then I came behind him and said, you know, my background is in risk management. I come out of the insurance business. I said, you know what? I would consider 10 a win, right? Honestly, if, if you can spare 30 minutes uh, sometime between school starts about 8 o'clock till about 2.30 or that is when the school day ends for teachers. So we're talking about during the school day primarily, right Becky or do you? We do have an after school offering at Orchard Ridge. Um, so we do have about 60 kids stay after school until about 5.30 at night. So I know for those of you that do work during the day that we could talk about potentially pairing up um, in the evening hours as well. But we are, our staff is, and students are in learning from 8.30 to 3.27, so. Okay, so, so that's the span of opportunity, about 8.30 to 5.30, if you have a half an hour, um, you can participate in, in this program. Yeah. yeah. Lloyd, you, um, you've told a story in your sermons before mm -hmm. about a tutor in your education that made a really yeah. big difference for you. Could you just briefly tell that story again? Because I think it's really inspiring. Really, it was a, a, a teacher, a Judy Kritzberg, uh, my math teacher uh, in, in my freshman year in, in high school. Uh, I went to a very competitive elite high school from a, from a Catholic school, and I was placed in a, a, a Algebra two class that I was just not prepared for. And Dr. Davis recognized it quick and put me in Ms. Kritzberg's class. But by the time I got in there, the school had been going on for a month and a half. I was behind. And so Ms. Kritzberg would spend her breaks in her after school time getting me up to speed. She had such an impact on me that I got an A in her class. And such an impact on me that I tried to take every class she offered. I don't care if I didn't have any interest, I took it. Because I knew Miss Kritzberg loves me. Uh, Miss Kundert, if, uh, I've been in her school for five years. And Je Jessica Smith was the first grade teacher I partnered with. What really sold me was how much they love kids and how much they go beyond the call of duty to help kids. And Mrs. Ms. Kunder is a principal, social worker, uh, counselor. Uh, she, get, she helps kids with rides, food. I mean, she wears so many hats. And when you see these public school teachers at action, helping these kids that really, some of them aren't even sleeping in their own bed, you just get inspired. So I came along because there are, in a classroom, there are really uh, kids that are doing extremely well, and there are some that aren't doing that well. And the teacher can't manage them all. But when I come in and can work with a few, I see education extended. And so that's why I come. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So um, in the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah 29, uh, God says to his people, he says, you need to like be part of your city, buy, buy houses and work jobs and do this, because your welfare and your peace are bound to the peace and welfare of your city, whether or not they're part of your, you at all, right? And that's a, that's a timeless spiritual principle for God's people who are in exile in every, in every country. And one of the ways in which we can be involved in a torn apart time in something that is super political, like it's, it's kind of beyond it doesn't matter what your views are, what you think, or what you're for, or what you're not for. Um, the public school teachers did not set up this system, and these kids did not pick anything. And we have an opportunity to do something we know works. And so by engaging in love, we know it's also effective. And so you, many of you know that at High Point, we've got like lots of homeschooling families, and lots of we have a private school. And our schooling theory is both everything. Like, a whole generation of kids needs to learn and to be formed in every generation. And so, like, I've talked with my homeschooling daughters about volunteering with me in the public school. Because to, together we can do a lot of really great stuff. And so, I want to encourage you that 
that this is a this is a very very concrete opportunity to walk out your faith, to show the city your faith and the beauty of your God, and to um, really live for the peace and welfare of the city that we're a part of, and to do it in a way that's transpolitical, like Democrats, Republicans. I hate politics. Like everybody can be like, man, I can read with a kid. I can do that. And that I know that makes a difference. So I want to encourage you to sign up and to do this and like make like a three-month commitment. Like say, I'm going to do it for three months and see. And I think if you spend that much time on these kids, you're going to, you're going to be stuck. You're going to be stuck for a while by your own heart. So let's pray. Father, we love, um, we love you and we love the things that you do in the world. And for some of us, getting involved in this might feel a little outside of our comfort zone. Um, but so we praise you for the hospitality that you've provided through Becky. She's just a very vivacious and loving person, and it was so easy to walk into that school and to be part of a class. And so I pray that you get us over any fears or inhibitions. And for those of us who have capacity for this, who have time or whatever, I pray that you'd, you'd move in us and show us what you want us to do and lead us to participate in something beautiful. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thanks, guys. Good morning, High Point and guests. Today's scripture we'll be reading is from Romans chapter 12, the entire chapter. This is found on page 1724 in your pew Bible. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will able, be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. For by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment, in accordance with the faith God has distributed to each of you. For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ, we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it is serving, then serve. If it is teaching, then teach. If it is to encourage, then give encouragement. If it is giving, then give generously. If it is to lead, do it diligently. If it is to show mercy, do it cheerfully. Love must be sincere. Hate what is evil, cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Do, do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. This is the word of the Lord written for his people. Amen. Hey everybody, you ready to get to it? Okay, we've been um, talking about joy and fighting for joy, and we, I don't know why I thought that was falling. Um, <coughs> um, we have a couple memory verses that are right there, and now they're gone! So the first one is 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, which says, Be joyful always! And the second one is Romans 12, 12a, which is, 
Be joyful in hope. You guys are so great. Okay, you're going to have to get the references next time. But there it is. Good job. All right, so we're talking about fighting for joy, specifically in relationship to the four marks of spiritual substance we covered in the substance series last fall. And so this morning I want to focus on um, self-sacrificial love. And so um, one of the things that we talked about with love is that sometimes we don't, we don't think of love as, as expansive and as complicated and interesting and stuff as it is. So w- w- there, there are a lot of things in life, actually, that like seem easy, but they're a lot, a lot more complicated than we think. So w- one example of this is a grocery store. And I don't want to talk about this too much because I'm afraid my wife will invite me to go to one more often. But a grocery store is something that feels pretty easy. You walk in, you pick out the food that you want, you put it in your shopping cart, you check out, you pay them some money, and off you go. And that sounds really great because it is really great. And yet, a a grocery store is like an incredibly complicated thing. Like, stuff from the other side of the world is there, okay, right? And there's like mangoes from Indonesia, and they've been like somewhere else to be cut and processed, and here they are, and there's like plants that you've never even seen in real life, right? I mean, and there's, you know, there's like, and there's like like coffee. Like, it comes from like, you can be like, Will I have coffee from this continent or that continent? Like, the only one that's not a choice is Antarctica, and they'll have hydroponics there soon. You know, like, it's, it's, I mean, like, there's just, it's the, the, nobody on earth could possibly put together a grocery store. All the different things that, all the things that get it there. There's not enough knowledge in any one person. There's all these millions of people throughout the world cooperating and sharing with each other and figuring out what they can provide, and it all comes together in, like, your grocery store. Okay? And it's astounding. Right? If you haven't read, um, Leonard Reed's um, essay, My Eye Pencil, is like three pages, and it's basically this concept, and you, you haven't been properly economically educated until you've read it anyway, so if you haven't read it, read it. Read the book of Romans first, if you haven't read that, though. So, <clears throat> um, and so there are certain things that are like this, that they, they seem simple, but they aren't, right? They're more complicated than they seem, and so in, in order to pursue them, it requires a really kind of a great ambition, because they're, they're a large and beautiful thing, and there has to be a sustaining passion for the pursuit of something like that, right? And so one of the things that we'll take out of, the, out of Romans 12 is that sincere love, or self-sacrificial love, like we call it in substance, thrives on the motivating power of joyful hope. Sincere love thrives on joyful hope. You can't, in the long run, you won't be able to be sincerely loving without being reliably joyful. And you won't be able to be reliably joyful if you are not full of hope. Okay. Now I want to talk about um, four things from this passage. The first is, is that living sacrifices live off of pleasure or joy. Um, one, I've heard a lot of passage, pas, pastors preach out of the passage of Romans 12, 1 to 2 because they want to talk about, you know, being renewed in your mind, which is really good. I want to talk about that too. But one of the things that shows up in that passage conspicuously a couple of times that generally gets passed over is the appearance of the word pleasure. Right? It says, in view of God's mercy, offer your bodies as living sacrifices, which are what? Which are holy and pleasing to God. Um, Some translations translate that word acceptable, but as I work through all the different places translated in the New Testament, I think pleasure is right. I think that's one of the places where the NIV is actually better than the ESV. And then it says, okay, so this, now this is important. And then, and then it says, so don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then you'll be able to understand what God's will is, right? And why is that so important? Because it's not just so that you'll do it. It's partly so that you'll do it, but it's also because his will is good, perfect, and pleasing. That is, that a a living sacrifice— whose heart and life through faith is ordered towards Jesus and to the God that is revealed in Jesus Christ, right? That offering brings pleasure to God and pleasure to us, right? That, that in the being of a living sacrifice, there is a mutual pre- pleasure between God the Divine One and us the living sacrifice which produces a pleasure for our neighbors as it produces their true good, right? Now, one way, uh, one way to say this is the way John Piper said this. He's a pastor in Minneapolis, that God is most glorified in you 
when you are most satisfied in him. If we, if we say, take just the Romans 12 passage, it might be something like, God is pleased in you when you are joyful in him, or God is most pleased in you when you are most joyful in him. Now, the reason Piper says glorified is because he's bringing in other passages of the Bible, and he's also recognizing that when God is glorified, the pleasure isn't just what God receives and what we receive, but his, his beauty and goodness and pleasing capacity is displayed to other humans and other, other beings. And so the, the mutual pleasure between the living sacrifice and the God who receives that living sacrifice is actually spread to others who see that glory and who take pleasure in that glory. It's important to recognize that that mutual, that mutual enjoyment between God and us, and us being a living sacrifice, can only be found in godliness, though. So in both places where, the, where pleasure is talked about, with it are other words that talk about the character of that pleasure. So it's not like whatever pleasure you want to do, right? We're a living sacrifice. Sacrifices are given on very specific terms in the Bible, right? Do this, don't do that. Use this kind of animal, not that kind of animal. This is who offers it. It's always very specific terms. And so it says that we are living sacrifices. And we are living sacrifices who are both holy and pleasing to God. Holy means to be set apart on the basis of, of God's character, right? And then we get to the end, God's pleasure, or God's will isn't just pleasing. It's not just like, whatever you want is what he says, so go do it. God's will is good, in the most fundamental, moral, truthful sense, pleasing and perfect. Now, the word perfect in the Bible does not mean the same thing that it means in the Greek philosophers, that, like the, the best of all possible worlds. It, what it means is, is complete, mature, and whole. One of the better ways to translate that, because essentially the concept here is aesthetic, right? And so perfect in that context should have the emotional freight of oh, English word something like beautiful. That God's will, when we see it for what it really is, it's good. It's morally pleasing. It's pleasing to us. We learn to enjoy it. And it's perfect. It's right. It has kind of the right contours and shapes. It's beautiful, right? And we are meant not just to say, oh, I like that, but in its goodness and in its truthfulness and in its beauty, it appeals to a certain part of us that sees those things as beautiful as they're transformed in Christ. And when that happens, there's a mutuality between us and God, because what God gives us is only himself. It's going to be good, true, and beautiful. And if we don't like what's good, true, and beautiful, we just want to do whatever we want, we're not going to find it pleasing at all. But when, because, because of God's mercy, when we come to Christ— and he begins to transform us. And as living sacrifices, we begin to see God's glory and his holiness and his goodness. And we become unconformed to the world. And we become transformed by the renewing of our mind. We begin to find God's will not just good. We'll find it good. We'll see why it's good. We'll also see why it's perfect. But we'll also learn to incredibly deeply enjoy it. Now, one of the reasons why this is important is because a lot, what a lot of people think when they don't understand that God's will for us is joy, is they think that, that, they think that the decision in relationship to religious faith is this, that what religious faith offers is, is this conundrum. You can either do what you want that'll make you happy now, and then be unhappy forever in hell, okay? Or you can do what won't make you happy now, and you can be like a good person, and then God will reward you in eternity with heaven. And when most people listen to that, they're like, that's stupid. Like, that is the most idiotic thing I've ever heard of. And so a lot of people say, well, there probably isn't a God, because like the, the divine, a divine mind would never come up with that. So it's probably people just trying to control people, right? And you see this with like, you know, village atheists kind of like, or like, I'm going to be this like skeptical reason guy or whatever in the weirdest possible way. And they like, they use, this is the straw man they use. Religious people believe this thing, and it's just for controlling people. And if that's what the Bible taught, then maybe that would be true. But that's not what Scripture teaches at all, right? There, there actually is no conundrum, right? What God says basically is, is that if you choose to reject what's holy, good, and perfect now, and you don't care about the will of God, you do whatever you want to do, that the Bible calls that sin. And sin is going to produce at least intermittent, but probably fairly reliable, misery. And if you're like, well, I don't, I do what I want, and I'm not that miserable. Okay, but everybody around you is, okay? Because the kind, the kind of happiness that comes from ungodliness is always vampiric. It's always sucking 
good things out of other people so that you can have them. And so if you, if you live out of the mutuality of love, in what the Bible calls sin, or the rejection of the good, perfect, and holy, you will be yourself intermittently or reliably miserable, and you will produce reliably misery. And then, that'll just be confirmed forever in the misery that you've created in and for yourself in your own self-created damnation with the addition of God's judicial damnation, right? The other option is to receive the good, true, and beautiful as displayed in Christ, accepting his death and resurrection for you, putting off the deserved damnation and the growing damnation in yourself to be renewed in the image of your creator for, like it says in Ephesians, remember, true righteousness and holiness— and to learn to become a living sacrifice, being unconformed from the pattern of the world, transformed in the renewing of your mind, and learning not just to bring pleasure to God, but to actually receive pleasure from God in what is good and perfect. And then that just gets amplified forever. Like, listen, how do you think, if you believe that there's a heaven and you believe that we can go there, why do you think heaven will be good? Like, what do you think we're doing there? Like, do you think that there's, like, some special kind of, like, heavenly water slide that's, like— I mean, it, like, these fundamentally different realities. It, but they're, they're not, really. The picture of heaven is actually a human community in which God is there, just not cursed and full of goodness, perfection, and holiness. So every friendship is everything it ever could have been. Every love is everything it ever could have been. Every, every enjoyment of all truths and all goodness, all things that could bring pleasure to the mind, all of these things are all that they ever could have been. And there are consistent and constant revelations of deeper glories forever in an inexhaustibly infinite God. That is, what is good, true, and perfect is amplified forever. That's the choice. That's always been the choice. And that requires faith. And that's why everything in the Bible comes down to faith, whether or not you'll believe. Because it's not some idiotic conundrum that just is going to make you miserable one way or the other. It's whether or not you'll believe to choose the one who wants to give you something now that he wants to amplify forever. Right? The second thing is that joy and everything else, really, must be rooted soberly in good and in, in the good and the perfect, or what sometimes we call humility. So after those first verses, it's easy to say, yeah, Nick, I believe that. Like, I'm a Christian. I believe that, like, we're living sacrifices, and, like, I'm supposed to be unconformed from the world, and transformed by the renewing of my mind, and then I'll see God's will, and then I'll be— Like, I, I believe all that stuff. I'm still a little miserable. I'm not feeling a lot of joy, but I believe all that stuff. And see, these next verses is the Apostle Paul saying, no, you don't. Okay, the next verses are essentially a challenge. That like the very first, most basic step of the renewing of your mind, you don't believe. And what he, he basically says this. Think about your last week. How did you move towards and away from other people? Who did you esteem and not esteem? Who did you wish you could spend more time with or less time with? Who did, like, whose favor did you want? All of that. Think about that for a minute. And ask yourself this question. Did that move in and out solely on the basis of how much faith that person has, at least within the community of Jesus? Did you esteem people in terms of their godliness or who they were on the basis of how much faith they had, or was it anything else, even something spiritual? Right? So this what he says. He's like, For by the grace given me, I say to every single one of you, right? So that's very specific. We're supposed to each hear this individually, right? He says, I say to each one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, humility, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance to the measure of faith God has given you. The measure of faith God has given you. Now, in, in church, sometimes we kind of spiritualize this. So he goes on to talk about spiritual gifts, right? And he says, like, if you prophesy, it's with how much faith you have. If it's leading, do it diligently. If it's giving, give generously. If it's serving others, do it cheerfully, right? Now, why does he say that stuff? Is it because he wanted us to know that there's a diversity of spiritual gifts in the church and that we should recognize them and love, that, love everybody because everybody has different gifts? And the answer is no. He assumes that. Right? If you want to find a place where Paul teaches it, 1 Corinthians 12 to 14. 
Here he assumes it. And what he's saying here is saying, listen, if you're a Christian and God has given you a spiritual gift and that spiritual gift is teaching, who cares? Who cares? It doesn't matter. It has no bearing on anything. All that matters is, do you teach? <laughs> right? Like if you have the gift of teaching, what matters isn't that you have it. What matters is, do you use it? Do you teach? Right? And if you, if you're, if you have the gift of leadership, who ca Nobody cares that you have the gift of leadership. The, qu the question is, do you use the gift of leadership to serve others diligently? And if you've got money and you like giving money away, who cares? Unless you do it generously. You do it. Right? And if you help others, nobody wants you to help others. Like, mean? Are you cheerful? Do you do it in the right kind of way? Why? Why does this matter? Because what he's saying is he's saying this. He's saying even in the church, you could see spiritual gifts, even spiritual gifts like prophecy, as like reasons we should esteem each other. And that has no bearing on how we should esteem each other. The question is, is whatever you have, is it combined with faith? Even your spiritual gifts. Not even your education or your good looks or lack thereof. Right? It's, do you combine it with faith? If a teacher teaches well, it's because they took a gift and they're combining it with faith. Right? If somebody who gives, gives generously, it's because they take their money and they combine it with faith and they give. If somebody serves cheerfully, they realize the other person is more important than them because they bear the image of God and they're supposed to esteem others and they realize that because of their faith. And so they're cheerful because it's their faith that makes the difference. Do you understand? And that's how we're supposed to esteem each other and that's how we're supposed to see ourselves. Why? Because that is the first and number one lesson of being unconformed to the pattern of this world and being transformed by the renewing of your mind. And if you don't do that, that you don't believe yet in the first three verses of this passage. That's what he's saying. It's a challenge, right? We say, I want to be unconformed to the world and transformed by the renewal of your mind. Right. And how much favoritism have you shown in the last 12 minutes? Right? Whether you think I'm preaching well or badly. Right? The question is, am I doing it diligently and can you learn something? Right? Same lesson in Genesis 3, right? Is the tree that the Adam and Eve aren't supposed to eat from, did that, was that because God wanted to withhold knowledge? Or was it because knowledge comes in a certain order, and the very first point of knowledge is that you can trust the trustworthy one, which is what? Faith. Faith is the first lesson. 2 Peter 1, 5, right? Therefore, make every effort to add to your, what's the first thing? Faith, goodness, and goodness, knowledge. Do you see? So what he's saying is, he's like, look, I know you think we know this, but I can give you just like the first example and we'll prove that we don't. And it's partly because we underestimate what love and joy really are. They're like the queens of virtue in human existence. They're two of the greatest things that exist. And they're, they're, they're not light and easy things, but they are great gifts that God will give us by His grace through faith. But we've got to realize that especially for love, to live out sincere love, it's going to require an enormous amount of power, an enormous amount of internal motivation, right? So there's this, um, there's this passage in the Substance book I, I brought up last fall. That I said, love is a little bit like a queen who has a number of sisters, and all the other sisters are like different virtues, like, like prudence and, and, um, and uh, steadfastness and fortitude and like all these other virtues are around love, right? And when they're all around her, she knows who she is. She knows she's the queen. She knows exactly what it means to be herself. But if you can separate her from her sisters, she totally forgets who she is. Because love is ordered and clarified and made clear and it flows out of the inner relationship of all the other virtues. Right? But it's not just that. It also requires a motivational set of virtues. Now you might be like, okay, Nick, I've heard, I remember you saying this before. This might be the first time. You're like, aren't you kind of complicating this? And the answer is, no, I am not. I'm simplifying it. In this passage, the, 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 the rest of the chapter starts with this line, love must be sincere. And then after that line, 
there are between 18 and 26, depending on how you count, commands of exactly what love means. Love is morally clear, right? It doesn't delight in evil, but it rejoices with the truth. It's, it includes mutual devotion, that you should be devoted to other people, right? It gives superior honor to other people. It's joyful in hope. It's patient in affliction. It's faithful in prayer, right? People who are loving share with others who are in need, especially those who are part of the family of faith. They practice hospitality with everybody. They bless those who persecute them, and they don't curse them. They rejoice with those who rejoice. They mourn with those who mourn. They live in harmony with one another. They're not too proud of their status to associate with people of low position. They're not conceited. They don't repay evil for evil. They do what's right in the eyes of everybody because they want peace and harmony, right? They live at peace with everyone. They don't take revenge ever. In fact, they serve the people they want to take revenge against, okay? Do you see how he's like amping it up as he goes along? He, and he ends with, you know the people who you think have destroyed your life? Serve them, All right? Now see, at that, see, this is the second challenge. You see, the first challenge was you don't even believe the first thing about being transformed in the renewing of your mind. Do you? You don't even understand faith, right? And now he's, now you're like, well, maybe, I, okay, fine, I'll be humble, right? And then he's, and then he's like, okay, listen, love has a character. And you're like, I'm a loving person. Maybe I have, I've screwed up in my thoughts about faith, but I'm a loving person at least. And he's like, really? Because love is only love when it's really sincere. Let me tell you a little bit about the character of love. And he starts saying, it's always ordered by good and against evil. It's like, it's this, and it's— And he gets—he's moving along, and he's like, and then you can't take revenge, and you can't hate people who persecute you, and ultimately that person who, like, destroyed you, love serves them, and it doesn't ever pay back evil for evil, but it overcomes evil with good. Right? And where, like, where are you left? Right? You're kind of like, oh, I don't do that. Right? That's good because, it can, because this love can only be pursued by faith, and you need to know you're a failure before you can apply for grace, right? If you think you can do it, you'll do it by yourself. But if you realize, like, you're not going to do this, then you'd be like, okay, I need help. The only person who can help me is God. <laughs> God, please help me, right? Because otherwise your striving won't be gracious striving. It'll be legalistic striving, and nobody likes that, and nobody will like that in you. And it's not going to bring pleasure to God, and it's not going to bring pleasure to you, right? And so when you realize that that's what love is, that love is not worth its name, that it's not at all truthfully sincere until it looks like that, we begin to realize that love is very difficult, and yet it's also the most romantic and greatest thing in the universe. And it is the greatest pursuit of all of our life, and in pursuing it, you begin to realize why, why the Bible can say something like, God is love. And it can propose something like, to actually pursue the kind of love the Bible talks about is to pursue God himself. Because love isn't this flippant thing. It's this sort of thing. Right? You start looking at that and you're like, okay, I don't do that, but that's Jesus' resume. Right? And so when we look at love, we have to, one, get a sense of what it is. And when we see what it is, it's going to be astoundingly depressing to start with. But listen, it's almost like, okay, imagine like walking over a hilltop and seeing like the Canadian Rockies stretching out in front of you, okay? And realizing that like you have to walk to the edge of what you can see. Like that's what's going to happen. You're going to walk all the way to farther than you can see, all right? That's a little depressing, right? It's a little because you see a long way and it's going to be hard. But listen— you're looking at the Canadian Rockies. <laughs> and to get to where you need to go, you're going to be walking through the Canadian Rockies. Right? The, the company and the view in the midst of the horrific failure of our humanity is assuaging. It's beautiful. It's self-forgetful. It's but you only see that if you accept the graciousness of it. If you're still trying to work it out, you're like, man, this is going to be so long. I don't want to do that. But if you're like, I'm going to just put one foot in front of another, and God is going to be with me, and I'm going to walk through this, and I'm going to come to the other side, a hulking, like, mass of muscle in the midst of traveling through the traverses of beauty. Right? You see, faith is necessary because your attitude is everything. 
So, but then you begin to realize is to walk through that, to transverse this kind of land, is that it, how, you're like, how do I do it? Like, if I feel like love is unreachable, does that mean, like, there's nothing to aim at? Like, if love is unreachable, then Jesus must be unreachable. None of this is reachable. And, the, like, that's one of the reasons why the Bible intentionally breaks these things down for us and says, listen, if you want to pursue godliness, you don't, you don't try to be exactly Jesus in one day. You take the stuff Jesus says to do in faith, and you just do it. And you trust that in doing it with faith, that Jesus is going to take that stuff and like work it in you in a way that you can't control. Right? There's something about character where you have to be in the game and you can't control the process at the same time. And it's scary because you're, you're afraid you're going to like, it's like going to the gym and not knowing if you're going to get stronger, but you're going to do all the lifting. It's a little scary, but it always happens. So like Romans 5, 1 is a good example of this where he says, listen, Therefore, since we've been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we've gained access by faith into the grace in which we now stand, right? So all that section chapter, through chapter 4 has been about how what God has done graciously in Christ, right? And then he says this, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So all that stuff about our, us being transformed by Christ and being saved and justified and made right with God through the death and resurrection of Jesus, how we receive that through faith and not by works, and there's no boasting, but we receive everything, and all of that is glorious, and it will lead to the glory of God. And in the glory of God is our hope and our, our pleasure being brought into that glory. And so there's great rejoicing in that. And then he says, he says this, and we also rejoice in our sufferings. Right? Because we know, right? Because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Does suffering always produce perseverance? Right? No. <laughs> A lot of people are babies in their suffering, right? But if, if we stand in the grace of Christ, like if we've been transformed, if we've been We've been drawn in, and we have hope in the glory of God, and we've been brought into the, the gospel, and the gospel's vision. All of a sudden, what looks like mud flats of suffering looks like, like Canadian Rockies of suffering. And it completely changes our attitude. And we go, okay, I'm going to walk through this, and I can trust God. I can trust Him. I can trust Him that this will be for my good, and for the good of others, and for His pleasure, and my pleasure, and I will, be, I will see something good and perfect in this, and it is going to do something in me. Right? It'll produce perseverance. Perseverance produces character. Character produces hope. And hope will never disappoint you. You'll be disappointed by your sufferings, but you'll never be disappointed by hope. And that kind of hope, the kind of hope that is born out of character and suffering and sacrifice through faith, is the kind of hope that no matter what happens, it can tilt your vision up to see something good, pleasing, and perfect. So that as you walk through this as a living sacrifice, it's not just God that is pleased by a holy offering, but we are pleased. We not only rejoice in the future glory, we rejoice in the suffering because of what it will and must produce in us. Not because we are great, but because God has chosen to use it to produce what he will. You can see the same kind of progression in 2 Peter 1, 5, right? He says, therefore make every reason to add to your faith goodness, to goodness knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, to brotherly kindness love. Do you see that same kind of progression? You, yeah, love is, love is, is astoundingly large. But you can start with faith. You can believe that the one who died and rose for you and has bought you for himself can lead you. Right? And then you can say, what is the good that's right in front of me that I can put my hand to in obedience and love? Right? And it's not going to be perfect love, but you find some good that's right in front of you, and you do it in faith. And what's going to happen is, you're going to learn some very true things about reality, which means you're going to add to your goodness, knowledge. And the more you understand, the more good that you'll see for you to do, and it'll be difficult. And you'll want to lash out, and you'll want to be an idiot, and you need to not. You need to trust Jesus, and that's going to produce what's called self-control, right? And then you're going to do that, and that's going to really build strength in you. And then you're going to do that over a long period of time, and you're never going to quit. And that's going to produce perseverance, right? 
which Romans 5 says produces character, but this verse says godliness. Same thing, right? It produces a new formational reality inside of you that is in keeping with God's character. You can call it godliness, you can call it character. Either way, it's fine, right? And that is going to produce the capacity for two things. In Romans 5, it's a capacity for what? It's the thing that's not going to disappoint you. This is participatory, and we're doing English. <laughs> hope! That character in that will produce hope. And what does it produce here? Brotherly kindness, which is the baby version that will grow into love. Do you see, do you see how that works? And so you, you can see love, and love can be the capturing beauty. And hope can bring forth joy, which will be the fiery motivation. And you don't have to get depressed about like, I'm just not that loving. Because you can start with faith. And with faith, you can just look for the good that's right in front of you. And you just do it the best you can. Just do it out of faith. Not out of you being a good person or you being a failure and self-atoning. But just, it's what you're here to do. Just do it. Just find the good and do it. That's it. And you'll learn, and you'll have wisdom, and that'll lead to self-control, which will lead to perseverance, which will lead to character or godliness, which will lead to hope, and will lead to love. And you've got to go through that thing, and you've got to go through that thing, not legalistically, but through a kind of gracious striving, trusting God in faith every step. Right? I don't know if you noticed in this passage, but of all the, like, 26 things the Apostle Paul said love has to be, most of them were things that happened between people. But four of them are about what's going on inside of you. Right? And you could call these the fuel virtues, right? Like a stove is this structure by which the heat of the fire of the passion of the burning, right, keeps the house from getting burned down, but converts the heat into usefulness for everyone. That's what virtue does with love and with human passion. Right? Instead of our passions, like going out selfishly and wrecking everything and burning the house down, the virtues are like a, a furnace that takes human passion, causes it to burn as much as it can burn, and then takes that heat and distributes it for the good of everyone. That's why without virtue there can be no love. But there has to be a burning, there has to be a burning, otherwise it's just like a flatlined, legalist, critical stuff. And so what he says, Paul says, is he's, he's like, you need to be vigilant about these four things. You need to keep up your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Like you're, you need to work on raising your affections and your emotions. That's why we, like, that's why we have worship. That's why we study the Bible. That's why we pray. There's a ton of stuff that we do that are specifically designed to help keep up our spiritual fervor. That's why we do them. Because these are in our court. They're stuff we can strive after, right? And then the next is, being joyful in hope. Be joyful always. That's a command. It's a command because it can be done in faith because there's so much in the glory of God, like it says in Romans 5, to be hopeful about. There's an infinite amount of things to gaze upon in the beauty of the glory of God, no matter what our suffering is. And therefore, we can, in hope, always be joyful. Right? But it's, it's not always going to be easy. A lot of times it's going to require the diligence of utilizing the virtue of hope to see what doesn't want to put itself in front of our face because of our flesh, and to, and to use hope as a telescope to draw in the glory of the galaxies of God's goodness through the fog of our suffering so that we can— it's in front of our eyes so we can see it and enjoy it in the middle of the suffering that we have to endure, which we have to endure patiently. Because without perseverance, we don't get to hope, real, reliable hope and love. And one of the disciplines of that is to keep turning to God in faith, which is what we call prayer, right? By not just meditating or trying to relieve our stresses or something, but actually turning to the one who is a person, the one whom we trust, the one in whom has everything that we need, and talking to him, right? And if, like, you're like, Nick, this, I mean, I want joy, but, like, this whole thing is hard. Listen, you have no idea if you can be happy in God if you don't pray. Okay. Because not praying is, is essentially— and listen, this is hard for me. I've always had trouble with prayer because I have ADD and almost narcolepsy. And you try, like, having a great prayer life when, like, you're paying attention to everything and you fall asleep whenever your body stops moving for 12 seconds, okay? It's, it's a thing, okay? It's like, it's not super easy. But 
I've, I've always, I've never, I've never given up the struggle to grow as a person of prayer because I know that there is no Christian path <laughs> that doesn't include a talking to the one and relating to the one who saved us. There's, there's no version of Christianity that doesn't include prayer. That doesn't mean if you don't pray, you're not a Christian. It just means that you're not utilizing the foundational virtues to build up to the greater ones. And so if you're suffering from a lack of hope and a lack of joy and a lack of love, you don't go, God, make me more loving, or like just try to, to jerry-rig up love or whatever. You go to the foundational virtues and you say, where do I start? You start with faith in the gospel to do the good that's in front of you, knowing that God will reveal knowledge. You pray for God to help and bring something out of that, and you then begin to work in the momentum of the transitional growth of your character. There's no shortcut. There's a shortcut to forgiveness of your sins, but there's not a shortcut to the being renewed in the image of your Creator through the work of the Spirit. You've got, you've got to hike the Canadian Rockies for that. You can see these same four things in the First Thessalonians passage. Right? That we memorized? So, be joyful always. Joy, that's joyful in hope, right? Pray continually. That's really close to faithful in prayer. Give thanks in all circumstances. Now, if somebody says, hey, be nice to everybody all the time, what does that mean? It means there's going to be idiotic people who are jerks and are going to make you really angry. Be nice to them too. Right? The assumption is even in the negative situations. So, thanks in all circumstances is basically the same thing as being patient in endurance, right? And don't put out the Spirit's fire is very similar to keep up your spiritual fervor. You see, like, even, even here, where he isn't literally repeating it exactly, those same four things keep coming up, right? Be part of this, your spiritual zeal. And he says, don't put out the Spirit's fire. He means in other people. So don't come to church and be like, oh, that person's so, like, excited. And I just, ugh. No. If they're excited about God, you try to get on their train. Don't try to pull them off into your, like, cow dung-filled pasture of hopelessness, okay? Like, that's one of the reasons why we're supposed to come together for worship. Because human beings emotionally feed off of each other. And if we're supposed to be, like, raising our affections as much as possible, some of that is supernatural, some of that is intellectual, but some of it's social. We're supposed to come together and feed off of each other to keep up our spiritual fervor serving the Lord. And to derive joy from our relationships with one another and enduring things together and helping each other endure things and praying together. Right. Now, I want to go quickly through. So here are, the, here are the five things I'm hoping you're going to take away from this sermon. One, you have to pursue godliness through faith. I hope I've said that enough times. If you're like, okay, I guess I got to do this. No, 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 no. You need to walk with Christ into this. You, you just need to fail in the right direction. That's all. You don't have to earn your favor with God. He loves you already. That's why he sent Christ while you were still his enemy. He sent Christ to die for you. Okay? He's perfectly comfortable with us not hitting the bullseye every time we shoot the arrow of love. But if you aim for the bullseye in faith, you might hit the target, which is nice. Okay? The second thing is, is that knowing that God's will is not just perfect, but it's also pleasing. If you just believe that just God just wants you to be a good person, and you just need to try to be a good person, and you don't realize that your present and eternal joy is wrapped up in it, and the present and eternal joy of everybody around you who's your neighbor, and the, and the present and increased joy, because God is always joyful. He, is the, he, he has the divine mind. He knows all good, true, and beautiful things, and he is infinitely, he can infinitely enjoy himself. Okay, so there's no lack of joy in God, but he creates other creatures, and in our mutuality, his joy is even increased. But our enjoyment is found as derived from him. And so we will never find the joy that is for us, and neither will our neighbors, if we're not pointed to him, and knowing that he's not just supposed to be the one who makes us good, but he's the one who we find our pleasure in, and in his will. Third is that you have to start with discernment. If you don't, if we don't realize what isn't, isn't happening, what isn't, isn't true, we're not going to get anywhere. And like it says in Matthew 6, the eye is the lamp of the body. If you can see, man, you're going to get a long way. In 2 Peter 1, 5, it says, try to add to your faith goodness and the goodness knowledge. You got to be able to see. And here it says, look, hey, you need to be able to see, to esteem people on the basis of what God has given you. Be, spiritual sight 
is incredibly important. What we call discernment. And growing in discernment and wisdom is incredibly important. And you need to grow. We all need to grow in discernment. Fourth is don't take love lightly. It's going to require a great power, but it's also the greatest romance of your life. Right? There's this— Sometimes I tell this joke where there's, there's, there's this sort of cultural thing where we pretend in romance that women are these very complicated creatures and men are these relatively simple creatures. And it's romantic because there's all these layers you can peel back on a woman. There's just like infinitely interesting, which is of course totally false. Um, women are very simple creatures. Men are very simple creatures and also infinitely complex and bearing the image of God. The, the onion that there's a thousand things to peel back is the love that can exist between them. It is love that is the infinitely interesting thing. It is the love itself that is the infinite romance of the mind of God. And that's true in the romantic relationship. But the reason why the romantic relationship is so great is because it's love. Bound together in the, the way that men and women are compatible with each other. But that infinite possibility for love is also available to everybody who doesn't have a romantic relationship. That's why Christianity has a strong doctrine of singleness, right? You're still a completely a whole person if you're single. Because the infinite number of joys and love can exist in friendships and in families and in all interpersonal relationships and in our relationship with God. The great bulk of the pleasure of mutual love is not the sexual part of it. It's the love part of it. It's why people used to have friends, not just sexual partners. And it's one of the reasons why we're less happy now. It's not because we're not having more partners. It's because we have fewer deep, meaningful friendships. Then pursue virtue foundationally. Build your character from the bottom up or you'll give up. If you see what love really is, and you see what joy really is, and you, you'll have one of two responses. Either you will completely fall away in despair, and you'll be like, screw this, I'm not doing this religion thing. Or you'll say, there's nothing I would rather do than hike the expanse of those Rockies. But I'll start with this step here. Right? The first virtue, which is faith, goodness, knowledge. Because if you don't do that, you will give up. You have to understand that there are foundational virtues you start with. And then lastly, cultivate spiritual zeal daily with ferocity, vigilance, and community as training. You'll notice that those are the four things from the second half of substance. There has to be a certain amount of ferociousness and vigilance in us in pursuing spiritual zeal, keeping up our spiritual fervor, being joyful in hope, patient in enduring, suffering, and faithful in prayer. If you start there, working those foundational virtues of stirring up the fire of passion— for God, and for life, and for goodness, and for truth, and for love, and for hope, you will find yourself increasing in the fuel to walk this path of ever-increasing goodness, of ever-increasing beauty, and of ever-increasing pleasure. Let's pray. Father, we pray that you would be with us as we try to walk out this path. We recognize and we confess before you that it's very easy to turn this into a moralistic kind of thing where we're like, okay, I'm going to be that loving person. I'm going to be like so great at everything and to start working at it in a kind of our own strength that is unhelpful. Help us to start with faith every day, every moment, every action with faith. To trust you first, to believe you first, to rejoice in the glory that is in you and to rejoice also in our suffering work. Help us to strive graciously. Help us to pursue you as seeking first your kingdom and your righteousness. And help us not be held back by the sin that so easily entangles us or by having two masters. And give us the freedom of having a single and pure heart because you've promised that your yoke, the work you give us, the work you put on our shoulders, when we receive it graciously, trusting you, is a burden that is both easy and light when we have the right attitude of faith. Father, please increase our joy, increase our hope, increase our love. Make us the kind of living sacrifices that bring you holy pleasure, that bring to us goodness, pleasure, and a mature perfection and beauty, and that radiate out to our neighbors true and eternal goods. Pray in Jesus' name.